Hey, Al Scott here. First, I want to take a second to thank all the show's listeners, sponsors, and supporters for helping make this show what it is. I literally couldn't do it without you. And now I want to tell you about the newest way to help support the show. Whenever you shop at Amazon.com, stop by ScottHorton.org first and just click the Amazon logo on the right side of the page. That way, the show will get a kickback from Amazon's end of the sale. It won't cost you an extra cent. And it's not just books. Amazon.com sells just about everything in the world except cars, I think. So whatever you need, they've got it. Just click the Amazon logo on the right side of the page at ScottHorton.org or go to ScottHorton.org slash Amazon. Our first guest today on the show is our good friend Marcy Wheeler from the great blog EmptyWheel.net, and she's also at uh, First Look Media, The Intercept there. Uh, welcome back to the show, Marcy. How are you doing? Hey, good to be back. Sorry to keep you on hold during that, but man, I felt like saying it. Anyway, um, there's so much news uh, to cover uh, on your beat. Uh, we better get to it and, and quick. First of all, can you give us the basic synopsis of this uh, McClatchy story coming out? Uh, in pieces here now about the um, Dianne Feinstein Senate Intelligence Committee and their attempted oversight of the CIA on this uh, on their torture program and the 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 committee staff and the CIA both breaking the law spying on each other what is going on here uh, emphasis on attempted oversight um, so in December of 2012 the committee voted out by narrow margins. Um, the report. Uh, Don McCain voted with the Democrats to release the report. And the CIA was supposed to give their response within three months. They took six months. They said, oh my gosh, you've made all these mistakes. And either subsequent to that or before that, the committee staffers who had been working um, in, a, in a facility provided by the CIA, they weren't allowed to work in their own offices, um, had learned that everything the CIA said in its response to the report was refuted by an internal report. It's, they're calling it the Panetta Report. The CIA claims it's not a really report. It's just a synopsis of what the CIA itself said. But, but one way or another, people within the CIA in 2009 had said precisely the same thing that the Senate Intelligence Committee had said, which is that CIA was lying, the torture program wasn't effective. In other words... Um, when the CIA last year came back to the Intelligence Committee and said, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, the Intelligence Committee tried to say, but you guys agree with us. In 2009, you guys agreed with us. So now the, here's where the accusations start. The, um, as I said, the CIA provided this facility, and they and a contractor, I think it was SAIC, spent a bunch of time and money vetting everything that the committee staffers could touch. They're now claiming that somehow the committee staffers got outside of the documents they were allowed to touch. I'm not sure if that's true. Um, one way or another, in December, some of the senators started saying, hey, what about this, uh, this Canada report from 2009, which shows that you guys actually agree with us? And... Um, after that, the CIA came back to the committee and said, you guys access documents you're not supposed to access. And the committee did the math and said, wait a second, you guys are spying on us. Mm -hmm. So the committee claim is that the CIA is spying on their overseers, which appears to be true. They, they had access to, they basically audited the access logs for the network. That's the best now, wait a minute. I'm a little confused. Help straight me out here. The, um, uh, the CIA... Uh, they basically, they accidentally kind of tipped their hand by saying, hey, you guys have some documents that you're not supposed to have, or it was the Senate staff that tipped their hand and kind of revealed that they knew things from documents that the CIA knew they weren't supposed to have, or does it matter? In a hearing, a couple of the senators said to, um, I think it was John Brennan, said, hey, how come this report from 2009 says what we believe and not what you guys said in, in your report trying to prevent us from publishing this oh, document. Right. And then they said, hey, and wait so a minute, CIA you said, weren't oh. supposed to have had that report at all? That's the CIA's position that that the, yeah. that the committee had yeah. no right to the Panetta report? Right, and they're saying things like it postdated the end date of the study, which was supposed to be 2006, even though torture continued after, after that. Mm -hmm. um, they're saying that... Um, Either, you know, I don't know what they're claiming as to how the Intelligence Committee accessed it because 
these documents were so heavily vetted um, to great expense to you and me, I might add, um, and, and as a delaying tactic that it's, it's sort of remarkable that they're even claiming that the Intelligence Committee got the documents, um, but they are. And so everything's been referred to DOJ, to FBI, to investigate. Oh, well, but then they, Eric Holder's going to take good care of it, right? Well, I made the point that this is, this is very reminiscent. Um, a bunch of years ago, several years ago, the, um, the people defending the, 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 most, the, the actually dangerous detainees at Gitmo, the ones who'd been tortured, um, had done what's called the John Adams Project, and they had gone via their own means um, and found the identity of the people who had tortured their clients. And, and that's legitimate. I mean, in a death penalty trial, you're allowed to say, hey, these people were tortured, or even to say this evidence came via X, Y, and Z torture administered by um, Deuce Martinez. Mm -hmm. Deuce Martinez wasn't a torturer. He was an, an interrogator, but he was present at the time. And in and, and a very similar to move to what they're doing now, they squawked and... and DOJ said, we don't think this needs to be investigated. They went to John Brennan, who was then in the White House, and said, it has to be investigated. Oh, my gosh, the identities of our torturers are sacrosanct. They, you know, especially the people who were tortured aren't allowed to know the identities of the people who tortured them. Um, Patrick Fitzgerald did an investigation, and now John Kiriakou is sitting in jail. For, by the way, sharing identities that never got published. I mean, sharing identities, the, the, the most dangerous thing he is in jail for is sharing the identity of one of the torturers that only got published in a classified, a top secret uh, court court filing um, done by lawyers with top secret clearance that was never made public. So you and I don't know this torturer's name. It's not public. Um, but it was allowed to be in a court document, and as a result, John Kiriak is in jail right now. Mm. And, and so, now, for people but, for people who aren't up to their eyebrows in this, John Kiriakou, he's the only CIA officer of any description who's been held to account for the torture program at all. And you're saying it's close, because he told close, the name of a torturer, person, but, not that he tortured someone, he told the name of a torturer to a lawyer who put it in a classified court document. Never became public. He's in jail. The torturers are not in jail. And the torturers are not even, we can't even, the, the lawyers can't even discuss the torturers at their clients' um, hearings, at their clients' trials. So, um, but, but, the, but the point being that it was effective that time by, by investigating the people who were trying to investigate the torturers, and now they, the CIA got their effect, which is that their torturers won't be discussed at these trials. Um, very similar here, it feels to me, that, you know, all of a sudden we're no longer talking about why is the CIA preventing the release of a report, which we know says, A, the torch wasn't effective, and B, says CIA lied to just about everyone, lied to Congress, lied to DOJ, lied to the White House about their torture program. And, um, you know, we're no longer having that discussion. We're no longer saying that torture report needs to be released now because... We've created this side show of the Intelligence Committee and the CIA investigating each other and spying on each other and yada, yada, yada. Right. Um, when, in point of fact, I mean, this is the Oversight Committee. Right. CIA is arguing that they have a legal basis to hide the fact that CIA internally agreed at least to some point, at least to some degree, that their torture wasn't effective and that uh, they may have even agreed that they lied to Congress. I can show that they lied to Congress. The, the evidence in the public record it makes that very clear. But legally um, speaking, that's ridiculous, right? They don't have any right to keep secrets from Dianne Feinstein when she is subpoenaing documents or information from them. That's exactly her role, and their role is to say, yes, ma'am. And What am I missing? You're missing that they, when these conversations happen, say, let's make an agreement. And they're, they say that this violated the terms of the agreement, and, and golly, no one, you know, it's it just, I mean, it's nothing else that demonstrates how ridiculous our oversight system is, you know, because here you have the people who are supposed to be overseeing who can make this case 
to avoid being overseen, and it's treated credibly, which, you know, you and I aren't doing it, but everyone else is going, oh, oh, let me see what happened next. And it's like, no, the point of fact is they're trying to sell this torture report that shows that the torture didn't work, and they lied about it not working. Right. And they lied about a bunch more. Although, they lied about it not and even then, though, we got to be careful how we define work, because I think work means in the way that the public would imagine it's meant to work to prevent imminent terrorist attacks but it does work perfectly when you're trying to torture someone into pretending that Os uh, uh, Saddam Hussein taught him and his al-Qaeda buddies how to make chemical weapons works like a charm if you're trying to get detainees to say what you want right. and and that's that I think is the big secret and I think that is the reason why ultimately Obama is offering a fair amount of protection to CIA because um, you know the executive branch and the CIA like having this make up lies um, cover uh, and they protect each other that way. And so I think, um, you know, they want to protect that system. So yeah, that's that, uh, that unfortunately is why this is going to work, at least to some degree. Right. Uh, well, uh, it reminds me of what Julian Assange said over the weekend about uh, how the NSA wears the pants in the Obama administration, which I thought was funny. Uh, same goes for the CIA. Same goes for the fourth, the fourth branch of government in every administration, as uh, Jacob Hornberger was uh, talking about in his recent piece at FFF there. Uh, we'll be right back, everybody, with the great Marcy Wheeler to talk more about the CIA and the NSA and oversight and all the rest of this stuff right after this. Man, you need some new stickers for the back of your truck. Scott Horton here for LibertyStickers.com. Aren't you sick and tired of everyone else being wrong about everything all the time? Well, now you can tell them all what's right with some stickers from LibertyStickers.com. At LibertyStickers.com, they're against everything, so you know they're good on your issue, too. Whether it's the wars, police, state, gun laws, the left and right of the president, LibertyStickers.com has hundreds of choices so you can find just the right words to express your opposition and contempt for those who would violate your rights. That's LibertyStickers.com. Everyone else's stickers suck. All right, you guys, welcome back to the show here. I'm Scott Horton. I'm talking with Marcy Wheeler. Empty Wheel, as they call her online. EmptyWheel.net is her website, at Empty Wheel on Twitter there. Read what she tweets, at Empty Wheel. All right, and uh, so now let's see. We're talking about, uh, well, we're going to get into NSA here in a sec, but we're talking about this uh, uh, fight going on between the Senate Intelligence Committee and the CIA over the various torture reports here. And... Uh, the joke of what's left of anything like a uh, oversight process in Congress, if, if we ever really had such a thing since the rise of the national security state. Uh, but so let's not be distracted. Let's get right back to the real point then, Marcy, about this 6,000-page torture report. I guess, what all reason do you believe, uh, do you have to believe other than just the quantity of pages there, which I like that number. It's a big, long number. Uh, uh, but uh, it sounds like a, a long study. But um, uh, what reason, if any, do you have to believe that this is going, you know, if it were ever revealed that this has what we really need to know about uh, the CIA's torture program? Uh, I mean, other than just the fact that the CIA is freaking out about it, but they'd probably be freaking out no matter what, right? Well, I mean, they have tried really hard not just to prevent this truth from coming out, but they've done things like approve Jose Rodriguez's book, which is, I mean, and, and John Rizzo's book, I, I believe the 60, I counted, uh, something like the 61st word of John Rizzo's book, he was the general counsel of CIA during all, the acting general counsel during all the torture, or during, during a lot of the torture. And um, I think it was like at word 61 or something like that where he finished his first demonstrable lie. That's how full of lies the book is. But the CIA cleared both of those books. So the guy who was in charge of the torture program, the guy who legally approved the torture program, full of all their lies, and didn't approve things like John Kiriakou's book. I mean, pr pushed back against John Kiriakou's book. And so, in other words, what the CIA has managed to do is release a lot of propaganda. Same thing with Zero Dark Thirty, right? And Leon Panetta had a role in that, and we know he mm -hmm. was involved in classified, you know, basically leaking classified information in that role. Um, but the CIA has prevented actual truths from being released. So just lies, no truth. And at the very least, this report would counter that. It would, it would provide all of the evidence. I mean, a lot of it is in the, in the, in the public record. I mean, we know that torture with Abu Zubaydah didn't work. We know that he said a bunch of things that weren't true. We know you raised this before, even Sheikh al Libi who was tortured at our behest by the Libyans, or sorry, by the Egyptians, 
um, lied about there being a connection between Egypt, uh, between Iraq and the Al Qaeda that uh, that the Bush administration used to get us into Iraq. So you know, perfect example of a lie. He later recanted on his lie. It was proven to be a lie. It was you know uh, we know that that's as you said that's what the entire point of the torture program was. There are more. For example, Hassan Ghul, the guy who led us to Osama bin Laden. He told us about the courier that led us to Osama bin Laden, and then subsequently we started torturing him. And we don't know what lies he told, but but it was a very interesting time to start telling lies because it was uh, 2004 in the lead-up to the to the election. And mm-hmm. if you recall, they, they kept going, election, 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 which, of course, there has to be a terrorist attack to, to raise the threat level so that right. George Bush can be reelected, even though at that point I'm not sure a lot of people wanted him to be. Yeah, so you know, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, it's a uh, just kind of interesting footnote here that Jonathan Landay, who is the lead author on this latest series in McClatchy about this fight between the Intelligence Committee and the CIA, he actually did a study, and I'm sure you have plenty of your own at EmptyWheel.net along these lines, too, if I had to guess. Uh, but he did a great study in McClatchy newspapers about how the vast majority of the torture took place right before the invasion of Iraq and right after it. And it was certainly, as far as you could put together from, you know, the outside without direct admissions from Dick Cheney or something like that. If he didn't prove it, he showed that the the purpose clearly was here to get lies about Saddam Hussein, about Saddam's Iraq. Well, and not only that, but um, just as an example, every single one of the illegal wiretap program reauthorizations includes language. We never get to see the language. includes language saying, ooh, scary threat. And, and that's the entire logic they used to justify this illegal program. They said, um, the threat is so bad, we need to wiretap, you know, we need to start collecting in the United States. Um, and John Brennan has testified, probably not under oath, but he has testified to Congress that, um, that, that some of the information he used in those reports, he was the author of those reports, which I think is really adds a cherry to this whole Sunday of, Torture you're talking. You're CIA. referring to the endless list of orange alerts throughout O2 and O3 and O4 kind of thing. Right, right, but those orange alerts were were written up into legal documents and given either internally to people at the OLC who really approved it, or ultimately this phone dragnet we keep talking about. See, I'm segueing you to the NSA very subtly, but this phone dragnet, they had a meeting um, in in 2004 before the judge started before the judge approved the internet dragnet, approved this this bizarrely overblown in, uh, definition of quote-unquote relevance, and said scary threat, scary threat, scary threat. Um, John Brennan was involved in that, too. So the judge only approved that program after she had been told about all these scary threats, and John Brennan has testified to Congress that he knows he used he didn't say torture, but he knows he used evidence gotten through the RDI program and so probably through torture. So they torture people, and then they go to a judge and they say, here's the evidence. They don't say they got it under torture. Here's the evidence that the threat is very scary. And the judge makes a crazy, crazy decision to approve the collection of huge amounts of Internet uh, data. And ultimately, that decision would be used to collect you know, substantially all of the phone data in the United States. So torture... Judge makes a terrible decision, phone dragnet. Direct connection. Amazing. And now we know that the military tortured tens of thousands of Iraqis and Afghanistans in the completely lawless occupations of those countries, at least through, you know, 08 or something. Um, But now, as far as the CIA, and I don't know if you really know her, can you give us a a ballpark, your best estimate of how many different people were tortured by the CIA? Was it mostly limited to... Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and and Ramsey Bin Al Sheib, or or was it hundreds of people, or dozens, or do you know? Not that that would make well, it okay even to torture that son of a bitch, but no, they say a hundred people went through the program, and some of those still are disappeared. Some of those we have no idea where they are, whether they got killed, who knows? Shallow grave um, somewhere. And and of course we know, for example, they killed Gul Rahman, who is a guy um, who had a tie not even directly to Al Qaeda, but they killed him by by hosing him down and leaving him out in frozen freezing temperatures in, in back in 2002. Right, in the salt so, pit. I love that. It's so medieval. It's just amazing. It is medieval. Um, so 
a hundred people went through the CIA's kind of high level torture program. But a lot of, I mean, even at Abu Ghraib in Iraq and some of the other people that got killed in Iraq were sort of a joint effort between JSOC and CIA, mm -hmm. and they fought for a number of years about who actually, you know, cast the the deathly crucifixion or what have you. So, so the numbers get much bigger when you get outside of that that uh, outside of the black sites program, mm -hmm. um, because there were CIA people involved in other parts of the program. And then, and we also know too from the timelines, right, that some of this torture, I don't know if torture all the way to death or not, but at least some of this torture was taking place before they made up the memos to justify it, right? And so even oh, the absolutely. theory of immunity that you're protected from the memo wouldn't apply to at least some of these cases. The memos are, are frankly, um, in my opinion, the memos are a shiny object to distract us because... Um, Michael Hayden has said publicly, although that when he said it, it promptly got disappeared from whatever TV interview he made. I think it was with MSNBC. He said publicly that the torture program at the beginning was operated solely on a finding, uh, which is which means solely on presidential authorization. Right. And and that's you know and and there's a lot of reasons why we know that that is true. For example, Obama went to unprecedented lengths to keep that detail secret. Um, in the ACLU's torture FOIA, um, there's a little phrase in a CIA document that George Tenet basically put there as CYA. He basically said, uh, any torture pursuant to the, and the, the redacted language says something like presidential um, memorandum and notification from September 17th, 2001. Um, that phrase is classified and when the judge in the case was about to release it, Obama had his national security advisor, Jim Jones, write a letter. It never happens. Write a letter and get involved in this FOIA case and say, you know, you can't release the fact that this torture program was actually done on presidential authorization. Went very to great lengths to prevent that from coming out. Of course, I know about it, but um, now, now your listeners know about it. Yeah. And, and that's why I say the, the memos are largely a shiny object. The torture started, I mean... But now, clearly, wait a minute, though, where the we, rubber meets the road, though, the Justice Department invoked those memos to say, hey, look, everybody, shiny object, and then stopped their even preliminary investigation into even these murders that took place at CIA hands, correct? Correct. So this is a very substantive shiny object. It's a shiny shield that they really use. Well, no, no, no. Let me, let me say one more thing is, is for example, um, two details. One, so Ghul Rahman, I already mentioned Talk him. Talk real so fast. Killed. Okay. Um, they didn't use the memos we always talk about to excuse themselves. They used an earlier memo written by John Yu that wasn't approved all the way up to the top of the chain at OLC. I got you. All right, well, and I'm sorry I didn't get to ask you all the great Snowden stuff I wanted to ask you because there's all kinds <laughs> of new revelations there, but... Anyway, thank you so much for your time. I'm sorry I wasted the beginning of your uh, interview ranting about CNN's pot coverage, but it just made me angry. All right, take care. But thank you very much, Marcy, for coming on the show. I appreciate it as always. Take care. Bye-bye. All right, everybody. That's the great Marcy Wheeler. Emptywheel.net. And follow her on Twitter, too, or, uh, Twitter too at EmptyWheel. Hey, Al Scott Horton here to tell you about this great new book by Michael Swanson, The War State. In The War State, Swanson examines how Presidents Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy both expanded and fought to limit the rise of the new national security state after World War II. If this nation is ever to live up to its creed of liberty and prosperity for everyone, we are going to have to abolish the empire. Know your enemy. Get The War State by Michael Swanson. It's available at your local bookstore or at Amazon.com in Kindle or in paperback. Just click the book in the right margin at scotthorton.org or thewarstate.com. Hey, y'all, Scott Horton here for CashIntoCoins.com. So you want to buy some Bitcoins? CashIntoCoins.com makes it fast, easy, and safe to get Bitcoins. Just deposit the money into their account at any of the major banks they support, and then just email them a picture of the receipt in your Bitcoin address, and you get your Bitcoins. Almost always the same day it clears. In a tough, competitive new market, CashIntoCoins.com has the advantage. A great system and great customer service to keep you coming back. That's CashIntoCoins.com. Just click the link in the right margin at ScottHorton.org. 
Don't worry about things you can't control. Isn't that what they always say? But it's about impossible to avoid worrying about what's going on these days. The government has used the war on guns, the war on drugs, and the war on terrorism to tear our Bill of Rights to shreds. But you can fight back. The Tenth Amendment Center has proven it, racking up major victories. For example, when the U.S. government claimed authority in the NDAA to have the military kidnap and detain Americans without trial, the nullifiers got a law passed in California, declaring the state's refusal to ever participate in any such thing. Their latest project is offnow.org nullifying the National Security Agency. They've already gotten model legislation introduced in California, Arizona, Oklahoma, Missouri, and Kansas, meant to limit the power of the NSA to spy on Americans in those states. We'd be fools to wait around for the U.S. Congress or courts to roll back Big Brother. Our best chance is nullification and interposition on the state level. Go to offnow.org, print out that model legislation, and get to work nullifying the NSA. The hero Edward Snowden has risked everything to give us this chance. Let's take it. Offnow.org. Hey, I'm Scott Horton here for the Future of Freedom, the monthly journal of the Future Freedom Foundation at fff.org slash subscribe. Since 1989, FFF has been pushing an uncompromising moral and economic case for peace, individual liberty, and free markets. Sign up now for the Future of Freedom, featuring founder and president Jacob Horenberger, as well as Sheldon Richmond, James Bovard, Anthony Gregory, Wendy McElroy, and many more. It's just $25 a year for the print edition, 15 per year to read it online. That's fff.org slash subscribe. And tell them Scott sent you.